My name is Max Lamarzi, that's my giant head over there. I'm a Neo4j field engineer, and what I do is I blog about Neo4j. Uh, there's 141 blog posts at maxlamarzi.com, all kinds of crazy things you can do with Neo4j. Some of the stuff is fairly trivial, some of it's more advanced, but uh, I have really bad memory, so what I do is I just blog about everything. So if you wanna know everything I know, go back to the first blog post from 2012 and read your way forward, and then you'll know everything I know. It's really easy. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, Max Marzi, and then on github.com I host most of my code. Um, most of it is open source and MIT licensed, so you're free to grab it and borrow it and steal it and do whatever you want with it. Most of it is kind of proof of concepts, that's what I do for a living. I go to different customer sites and I have a week to help somebody build a proof of concept to solve a problem. If I can't solve it in a week, then you have a really big problem, or I just suck that week. But uh, anyway, so this talk is about Three quarters of my experience with Neo4j as a user for eight years and an employee for six. Half of it is technical, half of it is just me rambling. And 95% of it doesn't really matter, okay? What matters is that you go home thinking about graphs. And you hear at Graph Connect, graphs should be top of mind, but you have to kind of drink the Kool-Aid, become a graph person, get into graphs, make it part of your lifestyle, and kind of forget all the other bad databases that exist out there. That's, that's our goal anyway. So let's talk about what are we talking about. So we are talking about a property graph model, right? This is where things start. We don't have tables, we don't have columns, we don't have rows, we don't have foreign keys. All we have is these little objects floating around in space connected to each other by relationships. The relationships have to be directed and have to have a type. So here you have Mary drives the car. The car doesn't drive Mary, right? That would be weird. And then Mary uh, loves James, James loves Mary, but that doesn't have to be the case, right? Mary could love Cynthia or Ashley or somebody else. And then the properties can be different. So we have two nodes that look like they're people nodes or user nodes, but uh, James has a Twitter property, Mary does not. And that's perfectly valid, right? It's perfectly fine, which is a good thing and a bad thing. I'll explain a little bit later on. And then the other thing to notice is that the relationships also have properties, okay? This is a break from the triple store RDF model where relationships don't have any properties. In, in a property graph, they do. That's kind of what they call that. And then the other thing we kind of added is labels. So a node can have one or more labels that say this is the kind of node that it is. They're optional, but nowadays almost everyone has at least one label on a node. And that's all you get. So you have to build everything based on just this. Now your relationships can only have two nodes, right? Not, you don't have hyper edges, so you can build hyper edges using nodes and relationships, but just remember two nodes. All right, so if you come from a SQL background, this is what you probably already know, right? Tables. You have a customer that has an address. Okay, great, I have a customer table, I have an address table, I can connect them together with a foreign key, everybody's happy. But that's not the real world, right? A customer can change an address. Oh no, so now I have to have a pointer going the other way from the address table to the customer table. But I want address, I can have multiple customers, and one customer can have multiple addresses. So it gets a little messy, and then what do you do? You have a join table. So in this case, we have a customer address table that points both ways, it has practically no value except the foreign keys that where it points to. And uh, most relationships in the real world become many to many relationships. There's no kind of way around it. Uh, eventually you'll get that one user, that one special case, and boom, you have to go many to many. All right, now if you wanna query how this data is related, you have to perform some kind of join, right? A left join, a right join, an inner join, some kind of join needs to happen, which is fine. This is the way we've been doing it for 30 plus years in SQL. The problem is, that every time you want to know how things are connected, you have to execute that join. And what that really means is you have to find those foreign keys, see where they're connected, and kind of follow them through, right? So how do you find the key in a relational database? Well, you have to use an index. And if your database people have done their job properly, everything should be indexed nicely, and you have this B tree in there. Uh, B tree is a magical data structure. Right? It's a log n data structure, which means as your data grows by 10, your speed only slows down by two, which means you can get pretty big before you have problems. But the problem is we got there. We got this big data thing like a dozen years ago now, um, and it caused so many problems that you have this big data, more searching for keys, and you get slower and slower performance. And the more joins you have to do, the more lookups for keys you have to do, uh, the worse things get, and you start screaming at your database to go faster. And that's usually when you come to NoSQL. So the folks at Neo4j, they took the same data that you had and they just gave it a slightly different layout. Come on, there it goes. So we realize we don't care um, 
who the next person is if all you care about which conferences Max attended. Right? I don't care who the next person is. I don't care what other conferences exist in the tables. All I care about is the relationships between things. So it, the state is still there. We just don't need tables to handle this. We just have these nodes kind of floating around in space with these relationships. But we're going to do something with those relationships as well. And we're going to get rid of them. Um, the join tables, rather, into relationships. One of the things we always will say is, those relational databases, even though they're called relational, can't really handle relationships, which is like, what? How does that make any sense? Well, it's kind of the wrong model, right? They, when you, as you add more and more relationships to your relational database, it gets more and more complex, and it starts looking crazy. And if sometimes you'll walk into a DBA room or a developer room, and you look at the side, and they have this ginormous ERD diagram that's like the, the whole wall, and you're supposed to understand what's going on with that, and it's insane. Very hard to do. Right? Then you have this degraded performance, again, as your data grows, or the number of joins grow. If you try to do a, a table join you know, 15, 20, 30 levels deep, forget it. It's not going to have a good time. Also, we all say it's the wrong language. So SQL, built so many years ago, was built around the idea of sets and set theory, not graph theory. So if your data feels and smells and tastes like a graph, using SQL on it is kind of the wrong thing. Uh, don't get me wrong, SQL is great if you have nothing but tabular set, set data. And then it's not very flexible. And what that means is that you have to know your schema before you even add any data. Right? You have to know that this, this field is a var card 32, and that field is a long, and that field is a double. And you have to know what these things are before you even write any data to it. And if one user has a, a property that is a, is a long, the other one cannot be a double, the other one cannot be a string. They all have to be exactly the same, even if there's any. All right. So to kind of fight these problems, a bunch of vendors got together under the, the moniker of NoSQL, all right? So you have uh, four major categories. There's a bunch more, but these are the four big ones, right? Uh, starting from the bottom, we have the key value stores. This is Redis and React and, and a few others. And they, they did something really simple. They said, listen, joins are a problem. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to get rid of them. We're not going to have them. We're going to get a key. You get a value. Do you want to join something? You're on your own, buddy, all right? So they, they, they fix the join problem that way. They had the column families. So they did something different. They said, listen, we're going to pre-join everything for you. right? We're going to duplicate the crap out of your data. You're going to buy 100 servers from us, and we're going to make lots of money. Right? So you end up with 1,000 servers at Apple running Cassandra and crap like that. Document databases said, oh, that's a horrible idea. We have a better idea. We're going to take everything we know about an object and squish it all together into this nice little blob of JSON, which is fine unless you want to know how these documents are talking to each other or connected to each other. Then you have a bit of a problem. And then you have the graph database category, which said, hey, guys, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to take relationships, and we're going to make them first-class citizens. We're actually going to make them real. We're going to store them on disk, keep them up in memory. They're going to be physical, real things in our, in our data. Yeah. Now, the, um, the bottom three categories, document stores, column stores, and key value stores, typically are not ACID. They are not transactional. Although the big change was Mongo this year announced that they had become a proper ACID database. Whether that's 100% legit remains to be seen, but at least uh, they decided to make that shift. They realized that ACID was important, and they added that to their, uh, their product. All right, and most of these, once again, can't really handle relationships very well. Well, let's continue. So what's our secret sauce? Okay. Uh, no, it's not this. Um, our secret sauce is this slide. And if you're going to pay attention to me at all for this 40 minutes, this is the time to do it. So put your phones down and give me like two or three minutes. And if you have no idea what graphs are about or Neo4j is about, this is, this is the thing to remember, right? How this thing actually works. Now, this is not a perfect physical description of how it works. This is a slight abstraction. But basically, what you have is two giant arrays, one array of nodes, one array of relationships. Every record in the, uh, in the array is a fixed size record. So you're actually looking at one single node. You're looking at one single relationship on the screen, OK? Every node knows what types of relationships are connected to it. Right? So let's say we're looking at a social network, uh, and you have to be a node one. Uh, so the node uh, knows it has friends relationship, and that happens to be type one. So if we want to get all their friends, we can go to the type one relationship. We can ignore the type two and ignore the type three. Type two could be like their likes. Type three could be like where they live or whatever else. Right? And then every relationship type has two lists, one of incoming and one of outgoing. Uh, these are lists that contain relationship IDs, or basically relationship pointers. And if I can get my mouse to, uh, to appear here, because I want to I wanna show it, because I don't have a laser pointer on all those things. So we start at node uh, 1, 
and we go to type one, our friends, we go in the outgoing direction, we get to this R1. R1 points to the relationship array. So let's say it's relationship five. So we jump to relationship uh, spot five on the relationship array, and we say, we came from node one, that was our start node, what is our end node? And it could be node one million, fantastic. So now we jump to node one million, and we ask for some key value pair from them, right? So their username, the email address, or whatever property they, they have over here. And then we go to R2, and we do the same thing. We jump, we say, okay, we came from node one, what's the end node? Now it's node 12, we jump to node 12, and we get the key value stored. And we basically spin, spin, spin to the data structure until you run out of the list, and then you have all the person's friends. What's nice about this, though, is every type uh, list here is stored by node, right? So whether you have a thousand people in your graph or a billion people in your graph, getting your 150 friends costs exactly the same. You jump to the, the node you care about, you traverse 150 relationships, you're done. Doesn't matter how big the data gets, right? And there are a couple of tricks in Neo4j to write your queries so that it takes advantage of this. So it doesn't care how big the data gets. All it cares about is what you're looking at. And that's it, right? That's the trick. We pay a price, though. The joins are done on creation. Every time you create a relationship, what happens? We go to the first node and we say, hey, we're gonna add an item to your list and it's gonna be in the outgoing direction. So we go to the edge of that and we add one there. Then we go to the, the node where the relationship is coming into, we go to the, the list of incoming and we say we're gonna add an entry over here. So we save that spot twice, right? And then we go to the actual relationship object and then we save the relationship object pointing to the start node and pointing to the end node and then some properties if it has any. So it we, we cost us you know, three instead of one to add a relationship to Neo4j. Versus in a relational database, you go to the join table, but you add an entry with two numbers in it and you're done. Right? So that's kind of like the price we pay. Um, but you get the joins for free. And it's an O1, right? Everything is done by an array, so there's no hashing, there's no lookups, there's no indexing. Everything is done directly by O1 access looking at the next array. Because these uh, relationships, they just store an ID which points to the record. Really, really simple. That's the thing. If you get this, you understand why Neo4j is fast, regardless of size. It's just a matter of traversing relationships using arrays. No magic to it. You can build this in a weekend and have your own graph database if you like, really. I know because I wrote a few. But anyway, let's continue on. What this gives you is very fast queries for some use cases. Not for everything, right? Some of the things we're good at, some of the things we're terrible at. You wouldn't, um, you know, take a minivan and, and put on a NASCAR track. It's a bad idea. Uh, but at the same time, you wouldn't go shopping for groceries with a Corvette, right? It's a bad idea. So let's, let's talk about some bad queries, okay? Imagine you have a, this data where you have every actor in Hollywood and you have a height property for everyone. And you're gonna say, what is the average height of all the actors in Hollywood? Well, that's a terrible query for Neo4j. Why? Because we have to jump around from random node to random node looking for those actors, right? Because the first node could be an actor, the second node could be a movie, the third node could be a commercial, the fourth node could be a play. Who knows? You gotta go find the next node. And obviously, you might have a label that tells you where the actors are. You still gotta jump around quite a bit. And then you have to find the height property. Some actors may have the height property as the first property. Some actors may have the height property as the last property because any node can have any number of properties and they could be in any order whatsoever. So that's gonna cost us a lot more then a relational database that can just go to the, the actor table and do a scan, or a column store that can just go on the height, go across, and, and be done with it, right? It's a better query for Cassandra than anything else, for example. But if you wanted to know how these actors were connected to each other by the movies that they were in, like Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, then that's a perfect query for us, right? Same data, different use case, different query. Some things are good at, some things are bad. Doesn't mean we can't do it. I'm just telling you we're not the optimal way of doing it. And if you care about performance, you want to take that into account. But let's continue on. A little bit of truth, because a lot of the things we say is a little hype, but you gotta, we gotta realize it's the right tool for the right job, okay? Now, it all works as long as you can reimagine your data as a graph, right? And you have to look at your data and say, is this data a graph? Does it smell, does it look, does it taste like a graph? If so, a graph database might work, right? You will get better performance if you're looking for relationships. Not just the sets of data, but the relationships in the data. We have Cypher um, that was built for graphs, so it's really easy to explain or describe what you're trying to do with something like Cypher. And if you can't do it with Cypher, you can do it with Java, you can do it with Gremlin, you can do it with other languages that exist that you can plop into a Neo4j. 
And then the fourth thing we say on Neo4j is that it's flexible and consistent. What that means is that you can add data on the fly. You can add a node uh, that's a user with some properties, and they'll take it. And they'll figure out, oh, this is a string. Okay, great. This is a number. Okay, great. I'll store it as that. And the next node happens to be a user, and let's say the height property for one was a number, and the height property for the second one was a string. Uh, who cares? It'll just store it as whatever you give it. It does no schema. It's uh, schema optional in a way. So it lets you do this kind of craziness. Don't obviously let your developers have different types for properties as bad, but the database itself doesn't care. You can go crazy. And it's really good for proof of concept, so when you have a greenfield idea, you're not even sure what you're gonna build, just keep adding data to it and then see what happens, right? Um, but it's consistent because we have transactions, real transactions. You can start a transaction, you can make a thousand changes to the graph all over the place, and at the end decide to commit or roll back all 1,000 changes, right? Just like your relational database. All right, now this is where things get weird. If you know um, third normal form or traditional relational database modeling, uh, you need to kind of unlearn a few things. Of course, there's the, the normal way of doing it, and we always tell people this first lie. We, we, we told today that graphs are whiteboard friendly. Okay? Yes, if you wanna go slow, but if you wanna go fast, you have to get a little more creative. So let's talk about um, uh, some models that are not so uh, whiteboard friendly. So some models are easy, like here's uh, two. We have a person, Tom Hanks, who acted in a movie, another person who acted in the same movie, and then we have the characters that they played in those movies as properties of their relationship, okay? The properties of their relationship. Now, if you wanted to know who played James Bond, then this is a terrible model for that query because there's no quick, no quick way to get to it. Instead, you have to rip out the actor, or the character, rather, and turn that into a separate node, find the James Bond character, and then figure out who played that character and what movies they were in. So the models and the queries have to align. It's not like their normal form where this is the right way to model things and we'll just figure out what the queries are later. You have to build it from both sides. You have to build it from the data you have, from the queries you're gonna be asking and kind of mash the two together to get the right answer. And I'll go quickly to another example on how to model flight data, okay? Flights, airlines going from place to place. So you can model it like this. We have an airport, name and a code, flying to another airport, name and a code. And we'll stick everything about the flight in the relationship perfectly legitimate way. But let's say I wanna build a flight search engine, and I wanna say I wanna fly from New York to Chicago tomorrow. Then this is a horrible model for that, because I have to look at the uh, JFK airport, find all the flights for the whole year, look for the ones that are tomorrow, and find me the ones that are going to Chicago, and then, no, that's gonna take forever. Bad idea. But another thing we can do is we can kind of break that out and say, you know what? Flight doesn't really belong as a relationship. It feels more like a node. Let's go ahead and make it a node and we say the airport has a flight and the flight has a destination and we'll stick all the properties in there. Okay, things got better, but it didn't get any faster. In fact, it actually got worse because now we have to jump to two. So what do we do? You have to get creative and say, listen, the airport really has days, right? People are gonna be searching by date. So we can take the airport model and say the airport has days and on this day it has flights. So now instead of looking at maybe uh, 300,000 flights in a year, I can look at 1,000 flights in a single day. That, that made my query better because now I have to look at less of the graph, therefore my query is gonna go faster. But we can do better than this. One of the things we can do in, in graphs is, instead of having this has day relationship, we can actually put a date as a relationship type, which is insane, but that's not a problem for Neo4j. So now we can go from the airport through this dated relationship directly to the airport day. So we can even skip looking at the 365 days, we can go directly there which is nice, but that doesn't really buy me much. It only buys me 365 uh, relationships. So what I can do is I can get rid of the airport altogether and say I have an airport day that has a code, so it's JFK dash whatever date it is. So for every airport, I'll have many of these airport days, one, one per day, and then connect things that way. It's kind of simplify my model. Okay, that's weird. I've already shown you like four different ways to model the same data. They're getting weirder and weirder. Let's keep going and get a little more creative, right? So we could do this. Um, the airport day has flights, you know, a thousand flights, but maybe it only has a hundred destinations, right? Maybe it has 20 flights to Chicago. So what we can do is we can create a destination node and say this airport day has a destination to Chicago and then that node has only 20 flights. So now I have to look at less of the graph to get the answer so my query is gonna go faster by creating this destination node out of, out of thin air. But I can get even more creative. I can say, well, forget that. I have the airport day, I'm gonna create a relationship type 
that has the code of the airport in front of it. So now this airport day is gonna look at the ORD flight, go out that direction and get to the flight and then kind of continue on from there. So I can skip looking at any flights that go to any destination that are not ORD by using this model, right? So we, we're actually promoting a property of the relationship, or in this case, a property of the node way over there forward so we can skip looking at part of the graph that we don't really care about. And you wouldn't get here, right? You wouldn't get here unless you understood this slide. Why are we doing this? Because every node knows what types of relationships are connected to it. So if we tell it, go out the ORD flight relationship, we can skip everything else. We don't have to care about it, right? So now we're looking at 20 flights. It's gonna be incredibly fast versus looking at 1,000 flights in a day or 300,000 flights in a, in a year. That's the trick, one of the tricks. Anyway, there's a few more. Um, the thing to understand though is, you know, there is no spoon. There is no right way, well, hold on, there's no, Yes, there's no right way to model data in a graph. There's plenty of wrong ways to model data in a graph. But there's no right way, right? And the third normal form way that you learn, you have to unlearn. You have to get that out of your head and say, I'm gonna get creative. I'm gonna find a, a, a proper solution by changing the data a little bit, right? You have that power, go ahead and use it. And you can get pretty creative out there. All right, now, if you think that's insane, uh, take a look at what the folks from Marvel Entertainment have done. This is a presentation from a Graph Connect three or four years ago, where Peter Olson came along and said, hey, listen, we have a very complex data model. This is the fantasy world where anything can happen, right? People go back into the past, into the future, they have alternate timelines, uh, all kinds of wacky things happen. How do you model that, right? And they figured out how to do it in Neo4j using hyperedges, which is another advanced concept that I don't recommend too much unless you have to have it, and then this is the, the place to learn from it. It's about an hour long presentation, fantastic. If you haven't seen it, take a look. Uh, it'll teach you everything you need to know about modeling complex domains. And if they can model the fantasy world, you can model the real world, right? And if you're dealing with oil wheels or, or servers or routers or switches or people or whatever, that's the real world. That's gonna be easy compared to the stuff that, that they're doing. All right, a little more modeling just to uh, drive you guys a little crazy, right? Building a news feed. Um, like say you wanna clone Twitter, you wanna build your own Twitter. How would you do something like this in, in a graph in Neo4j, okay? Now, um, the way it's done, today is whenever you write a tweet, that tweet gets replicated out to all of your followers. So if you have 100 followers, it's not a big deal. If you have 10 million followers, it's gonna be a bit of a problem. And if you ever try to edit a tweet, you realize you can't. There's no way to edit a tweet. That's kinda weird, right? Because that's the way Twitter was built. You just can't do it. In a graph, you can, right? So if you were to build a Twitter uh, using a key value store or an object database, you do the same thing. You'd push out all these updates into someone's timeline over and over again, you'd be basically multiplying your data to all these people, right? And you'd buy lots of servers and, and you'd make a vendor rich. That's great, but that's not how we work in Neo4j. Now, you can model data like this. We have a user that follows a user, right? And they post something. So if I wanna figure out uh, what someone wrote, I can just go to the follows relationship, see what they've posted, and I have my post right away. I don't have to have this post be duplicated into my timeline, I can just read it. Neo4j is optimized for reads, right? So this is fairly easy to, uh, to get there. But the problem with this model is that day one is gonna be fantastic. Day two, I'm gonna have more posts and I have to filter out the posts from yesterday because I only wanna see what's new. And then a year from now, I have to filter out all the posts that happened in the last 364 days because all I want is the new stuff. So what do we do? Well, we change the model. We added, we take the, the date of when the post occurred and we promote it into the relationship type. So now we can go find me all the people that I follow and tell me have they posted anything today or yesterday and then get me the list of posts of the stuff they wrote today or yesterday and then do it a little order by and sort and my query is only as big as one day's worth of postings for the people that I follow, right? So it could be five years from now, it could be one day from now, it doesn't matter. The query is always gonna take the same amount of time and that's the other trick in the F4J. If you can write your queries by taking advantage of the data model so that your queries are linear, they scale regardless of how big your data gets, then you can always expect that same 10 millisecond response time regardless of how big the data gets. That's fantastic. Or you can forget about worrying about, okay, my index is gonna get bigger, my query is gonna get slower, what do I do? Forget it. This is always gonna be the same time, the same speed, just as fast, which is fantastic. But you have to get a little creative in order to make that happen. And there's more tricks. 
Um, I'm teaching a modeling class tomorrow, so if you're in that, I'll show you this and some other crazier things that are, that are available out there. But let's continue. Oh, and this is the, the more complex model. And if you're really bored, I wrote a 12-part series on how to build a, a dating site that follows a different model because people can talk to each other and you have conversations. Anyway, um, similar ideas on that are out there. All right. Now, uh, I mentioned the every node knows how many, you know, what types of relationships are connected to it. Every node also knows how connected it is to the rest of the graph. The idea is it knows how many deg degrees it has. So I have a, a node with a degree of 100, it knows it has 100 relationships. But not only that, it knows it by type and by direction. So I can say how many outgoing friends relationships do you have? How many incoming likes relationships do you have? It knows that data because it's there in, right uh, in the data model. So it's, it's nice to be able to ask that question and say, hey, if I want to um, unfollow two people, for example, find the one that has the least amount of followers, find that person, and then unfollow them. Uh, versus having to traverse and look for all of it, which is kind of nice. Uh, it's more of an advanced topic. Now, that was ugly. That was like Java, right? Uh, what happened to Cypher? We're talking about Cypher nowadays, not this Java crap. Well, we, we come from, you know, the, the 4J at the end of Neo4j, spoiler, means Java, right? So it comes from this Java kind of a background where it started life as an embedded Java library. And if you are so inclined, if you're a Java developer, you can pump uh, Neo4j has a library into your app and have direct connection to the database. And it has a little API that you can learn in about a day. There's not much you can do, right? You start a transaction, you get a node, and then you get the node's properties, or you traverse a relationship, and then you get the properties of the relationship, or you go to the next node and you do it again. There's not a lot to do. It's really easy to, uh, to learn. Now, if you're not a Java developer, don't worry. Uh, we have Cypher for that. Uh, this is kind of what it looked like if you do it in Java, right? Start a transaction, you find uh, a user, and then we say, traverse the friends relationship, find me all the friends of this user, get me all their properties, throw that into a list, and bring it back. It's not hard, uh, and these things are fairly easy. Now, if you don't like Java code, okay, that's fine. But I, am a, I, used, to be a, I used to be a Ruby developer. Uh, since I joined Neo4j, I had to become a Java developer, so I hold my nose when I code, uh, but it's all right. If I can do it, you can do it. All right, then we have the traversal API. Traversal API is insane. I don't recommend learning this without a few drinks in you um, because it's how we used to describe how to traverse a graph before we had Cypher, right? So it's a little wonky. It's really powerful, uh, but it takes some getting used to, and we have also bi-directional traversals, which are even worse to get your, you know, your head around. Um, but we have classes for this stuff, and it's out there. So, uh, it starts out simple, like, hey, I wanna go depth first or breadth first. I wanna go out these relationships, but not those. And then for these particular relationships, I want to go in this direction, but not that direction. I want to go five levels deep and, and no more than five levels deep. Okay, whatever you want to do, I'll go ahead and, and run it for you. But you're better off starting off with something like Cypher, which is easy to learn. If you know SQL already, this is a no-brainer. And most people can look at Cypher even without t taking a class and understand what we're trying to say. All right? Oh, this is looking all crazy, but uh, here's a person named Dan who loves a person named Ann. We have nodes, we have relationships, we have connections. Fairly trivial. This is boring though. I'm gonna show you some better examples. Uh, here's another one. Here's a complex one. And there's another magic trick. That's the star. The star means keep going. So we're gonna start with uh, John Doe as our boss, right? We're gonna, we're gonna find John Doe in the graph. We're gonna say, I want you to find everyone you manage three levels deep. That star means keep going. So keep going up to three layers deep. And you'll notice a zero in front of it. The zero means include yourself. So now the boss and everyone he reports to are called the subs. And then for each sub, find out how many people they manage. I'm gonna call these guys uh, reports. And I'm gonna take the count of the reports. I'm gonna bring back the name of the person and the count of the reports. So I can figure out you know, your whole org basically in one little tiny query, uh, and you're done. Versus the SQL query on the, the other side is, is a bit of a mess. Right? And if you have to go four layers deep, five layers deep, 10 layers deep, however crazy vertically integrated your company is, it doesn't matter. You just change the number and you're done. Versus the, the thing you'd have to do in SQL query is cry in order to write that, that 10 layer deep query. Um, and then, if for the best of both worlds, you can mix it too. So if you are a Java developer, you can actually take Java crap, put it into a sort procedure, and then expose it as Cypher, and then you can just run the Cypher query, and it's all happy. So you can do both. All right, let's talk about some use cases. Um, one of the big ones out there is understanding your users, right? Uh, whether you're looking at building knowledge graphs, you're looking at customer 360, kind of understanding what they're doing, what they're up to, what's going on, so you can build nicer things on it. 
And if you want to learn from the experts, there's a class that these guys uh, taught. It's on YouTube. There's like a four hours one for part one and four hours for part two. So if you want to go to sleep, uh, this is a nice way to do it. But um, they basically talk about understanding user behavior and looking at recommendations and fraud, uh, which is kind of nice. So how do you understand what's normal, what, you, what your regular users are doing, right? And what your not so regular users are doing, right? Suspicious behavior that's out there in the graph. And then how to split the two, how to understand what's normal and what is abnormal uh, so we can kind of prevent something bad from happening. First, you have to understand your users, right? Does your little girl like Rambo? Well, you don't know until you actually look at them because maybe they do. Maybe they do like Rambo. Maybe you look up to them, right? Uh, you can look at demographics like age and look at gender and kind of try to dissect your um, user base and see what they're about. You know, we do some, some random uh, looking at data here. Do little girls like movies that other little girls like? And we do some, some counting and we say, yes, they, um, they usually do. But the men, 25 to 34 in the red arrow, uh, are, are the least like little girls from between 1 and 17 because they like different kinds of movies. So let's say you're building uh, the next Netflix. Uh, you're not going to show someone who's a brand new user the same list of movies to recommend. You can ask them a couple questions. Hey, by the way, what's your age and what's your gender? And with that, I can give you a better personalized experience than uh, if I just give you everything and try to wait until you tell me what you like in order to get there. I'm going to skip a little bit of this because, you know, for time, but basically here's um, what little girls might like, Toy Story, Toy Story 2, stuff like that. Uh, what men 25 to 34 might like, uh, different kind of movies, Star Wars, American Beauty. So right away, by just knowing two things about your users, you can take that out, look at the rest of your user base, and provide them a better personalized experience until you learn more about them. And then you can drop demographics and look at individual users and what they're up to, right? Um, but the graph can be useful things like predicting edges, right? If all, all these people are connected and they're all friends, you're probably friends with them too. You probably know them. You probably know this person, right? Um, what movies should you watch? Well, if everyone that has the same viewing habits has watched that movie, then I should probably watch that movie. So we can predict that that's the next edge that's going to happen uh, in the graph. Uh, you can also predict ratings. What ratings should I give a movie? Well, I can look at what other people have rated that movie, kind of subtract the two and figure out what I might look at and rate that movie as well. Um, all right, and then we can do things like clustering and community detection to figure out uh, groups of users that you may have in your system. Um, let's keep going. Skip some of this because we are short. But the other thing to remember is that recommendations and fraud detection are two sides of the same coin. In a recommendation engine, you're looking for a relationship that does not exist. You're trying to predict a new relationship. In fraud detection, you're doing the opposite. You're saying, find me the relationships that should not exist in the graph. These two people are using the same credit card, the same IP address, the same device, the same social security number. Something is wrong, right? Looking for those relationships that should not exist. So uh, if you look at fraud, you want to model user behavior. Now, the, the obvious fraud sticks out, like the ones on the top right. Oh, yeah, that's obviously fraud, right? What's harder to do is, oop, is finding the ones that are pretending to be users, right? The, the long vertical line that kind of feeds into normal user behavior. That's a little wonky. That's, that's a little bit harder to, uh, to find. Uh, so let's, let's build a quick recommendation engine in like five seconds. If you watch Toy Story, you want to be recommended A Bug's Life, right? Kids movies. But if you watch A Bug's Life, you do not want to be recommended The Human Centipede. <laughs> so how do we do this? Imagine you have a data model that looks like this. We have a person who rated a movie, and we have a title, and they have a genre. So genres are a uh, collection. So a movie could be a romantic comedy, drama, sports movie, I don't know, whatever. What kinds of things? It could be an anime that's a comedy or an anime that's a drama, right? And people rated it, gave it a 1 to 10, whether they really loved it or really hated the, the movie. So with that really simple data model, we can build a recommendation engine. Here it is. Here's a little cipher. Hopefully you guys can read it at the bottom. And it's color coded, right? So what are the top 25 movies that I haven't seen with the same genres as Toy Story that were given high ratings by women under 35 who liked Toy Story. So we start with the movie Toy Story. We see P2 is who rated this, uh, this movie. And we're going to see the movies that they have rated, and we call them unseen. Right? Where the rating that they gave Toy Story is 8, 9, or 10. And the rating that they gave to the unseen movie is 8, 9, or 10. And the person's gender is female, and their age is less than 35. Right? Where they watched the movie, so the Toy Story genres are the same as the unseen genre, so the same kind of movie. And my household, which uh, is myself, Jane Doe, and James Dean, none of us have rated or watched this unseen movie. Take the 20, top 25 matches for this pattern, 
I order them by descending count and give them to me. And this is a you know, A-line recommendation engine that's looking at user behavior, that's using, looking at characteristics of the movie, characteristics of the users who are using for the rating. Uh, it's pretty insane, and it's eight lines of code. And you can show this to your boss and be like, look, here's a recommendation engine. It's not some crazy complicated AI thing or whatever, it's just eight lines of code, right? It's understandable. You can, you can say, this is why we recommended these movies to you because this is what we predicted, versus uh, a black box model that you end up with unknown answer. Uh, and you can get fans here, you can, you can build similarity scores between people and say, hey, these people have same viewing habits, so we're gonna weigh them highly and say, if they watch a movie, you're probably gonna watch what they watch because you have the same kind of uh, behavior. And this is a crazier query, but it's still like 10 lines of code doing K and N recommendation in the F4J, where we first find people who are similar to you, and then we use those people to figure out what they have watched that you haven't yet, and then we will recommend that to you. I'm not gonna go through it, but that's the, uh, the idea there. Um, and then Neo4j is used so for indirect relationships, right? For example, on one side you have people who are looking for jobs, on the right-hand side you have jobs that are looking for people. But they're not looking directly for each other. Instead, you have a person who lives in a location, you have a job that has some requirements, and the person who has those requirements met, right? So here's your cipher query. We start off with the user, here's Max, he lives in some location, and he has some skills. In that location, there are jobs that have some requirements where Max has something that the job requires. So I have at least one thing that the job requires. So the skill nodes and the requirement nodes are really the same nodes, and I can find that with this query. So it's kind of a circular match. And once I have that, I can say, okay, find me everything that Max has that the job requires. Those are my matching skills. Find me everything the job requires. Those are my required skills. And then do something really funny. Look at this filter. It says, find me the, the skills that Max does not have the job requires and show them to me as missing. So it's a partial subgraph match. And then give me an order by and give me the top 10. And what this gives us right, is a little uh, drop down or a little list that looks like this. Hey, if the first job, you're 100% match. Right? You know all these skills. You can apply to that job and, and get that job because you're a perfect candidate. The second one, you're missing CSS because nobody puts CSS in their resume. You just hit the plus button, it gets added to your profile and now you match for that second job. The third job requires that you know Java. Right? So you click the plus button and lie through your interview and hope for the best. Right? So we can't prevent that from happening, but at least we can give you a list of what you can match. And then from the recruiter side, they can see, given all the candidates, who's the best uh, candidate for this position? And who should you ask to apply as well if no one matches you know, some kind of threshold that you, uh, you may have set? Um, anyway, there's a whole bunch of uh, use cases, graph search type stuff that you can do. I think I ran out of time because this is like an hour presentation on, on 40 minutes. Uh, it's all posted online on slideshow.com if you're really interested. Uh, the point is though, um, learn this slide, understand it, sleep with it you know, in, in your pillow and uh, have it come through your brain. And if you get it, then you'll understand Neo4j, you understand why it's fast, you understand how to model data, you understand how to write your queries to make them fast, and you'll know everything I know. And thank you very much.